Amen. It's so good to be here and just stand in the presence of God. And anytime you're in the presence of God, the one thing you're going to experience and feel is His love. And Lord, we just want to bask in the love that you have for us. That even while we were yet sinners, you loved us, you died for us. Let's worship the Lord in this place.
said, lead me to the rock, which is higher than I. I know some of you this morning, you're facing things. And I want you just to forget about everybody that's around you. And this is time for God to minister to you in this worship. And you may feel like no matter what way I turn, the enemy's there. It causes sometimes for us just to stand still and say, Lord, I don't even know what to do or where to go right now. And here's the problem when we get to that point. It's not what we're facing is real, because it is. I get that. But maybe, just maybe, we're not looking high enough. I said, maybe, just maybe, God wants us to lift up our eyes to the hills from whence cometh our help. And some of you may not believe this, but I believe when David faced the giant, he wasn't looking at the giant. He was looking at his God. He didn't see the obstacle because he knew the obstacle mover. Amen. So you may feel like you're surrounded, but guess what? You are surrounded by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. And in this battle, some of the times the way we win is just lifting up our hands. Not in surrender to the enemy, in surrender to the victor, to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's how we fight. That's how we fight. Somebody right now just needs to lift their hands and say, Lord, I surrender. I'm not surrendering. You say, no, 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 no. Don't get me wrong. I'm surrendering to Jesus. Because through him, the battle's already won. I said, through him, the battle's already won. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, it may look like I'm surrounded. I'm so. It may look like I'm surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded. Yes, it may look like I'm surrounded. 
Lord today and I have a word for you. I want to just say thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Now this is our giving time and I just want to share a scripture, one that you've probably heard many times, but one that still rings true today. It's found in Luke the 6th chapter, the 38th verse. It says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you again. Listen, there are several ways you could give right now. And I challenge you, give, because when you give, God tells us it's coming back to you. You can text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, right now to 724-202-1530. You can also go on our website, myhopecenter.com, and just click the giving tab and you can give that way. And you can also mail it to us. The address is on the screen. It's 813-813 Fayette Avenue, Bell Vernon, PA, 15012. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in giving. And lastly, I want to just have you, if you could, please click the link and fill out our connection card. This is for our first-time guests, our members, regular attenders. Let us know you're here online watching this service and also there's a section there where you could ask for some information also you can fill out the prayer request if you have something you want me to pray for you about this week fill that out i promise you i read them every week and i pray for them so please take a moment and let's give to the lord right now and also fill out your connection card god bless you I'm going to let you be seated for a moment in his presence. We can just bring our lights up. Thank you. The Bible tells us that love never fails. It reads in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, it says, But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still." Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. And now these three remain. Faith, everybody say faith. faith. Hope, everybody say hope. hope. Everybody say love. love. But the greatest of these is love. Over the past two weeks, We've been looking at these three things that remain, faith, hope, and love. Healings, tongues, prophecies, all those supernatural gifts will not be needed in heaven. They are still alive and operating in the church. They have not ceased. They are alive. Amen? But as long as the church age exists and until Christ comes back, we will have those gifts. But when we get to heaven and see Jesus face to face, there's going to be no prayer and healing lines in heaven. Amen. I said there's going to be no need for words and knowledge in heaven. There's going to be no need for spiritual gifts in heaven because these incorruptible bodies will be made perfect when we get to heaven with Jesus. Amen. That's good news. And it's interesting because... I'm all for the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in them. I believe in operating in them. But the words of the writer said there's three things that are going to last even into eternity, and it's faith, hope, and love. And we've talked about faith, and we've talked about hope. So tonight, today, tonight, today, I guess it is today, right? This morning, time is, though, yeah, we're still morning. We're going to talk about love. Everybody say love. The one thing that the Christian should be known for and some of us are really known for what we're against instead of what we're for and one of the things that we are for is love everybody say love love love, love. bible says in first john 4 and 8 whosoever does not love does not know god because god is 
God is what? God is love. Let me just pray for a moment, and then we're just going to go a little bit deeper in His Word. Father, I thank You for this time. And Lord, we just thank You for this worship team that just brings it every week and creates this atmosphere where supernatural things happen in this atmosphere because of worship. Lord, I pray that over the next just few minutes, you just anoint me. That you let everything be said, all of you, and none of me. And I pray that your word would just speak to us. That you will speak through me as a, a voice today. Let every word be said, this all of you, and none of me. Take these lips of clay, take this heart and this mind, and use it for your kingdom and your glory today. In Jesus' name, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Whosoever does not love does not know God because God is what? Love. love. I believe there's a need for real love today. I said there's a need for real love today. We live in a world that is desperate for real love. And we live in a world that likes to glorify love and the subject of love. And sometimes I think we're just a little misguided in society of what we think real love is. Society will try to tell you that real love means sex. But let me just say this. Real love is not sex. Right, Come on. Amen. And let me just say this too. Sex is for married people. All right. Amen. You hear that young people or single people? It's for married people only. All right. Some people will tell us that love is indulging in anything that you like. You know, some of us think love as we see. And it's interesting because we use the term love very loosely at times. You know, sometimes you'll see those pair of shoes and I just love those shoes. I got to have these shoes. And sometimes we think that showing love to our kids is spoiling them and giving them those very expensive shoes. It's amazing what tennis shoes cost today. Has anybody ever buy a pair of shoes recently? So, man, I'm telling you, my... Parents, I was so spoiled. We had the Kmart brand. They were $10. Everybody envied us in school. Not really, but they even had a name on the side called Athletics. I don't even know what that meant, but it didn't work. I wasn't very athletic. But anyway, we think if we buy things and we indulge in things, that's love. And maybe if we get a new car, I just love this new car. I just love this new house. It's not love. Society twisted today because they'll try to tell you the tolerance is love. Doesn't matter what you believe, what you identify, what your thoughts are, what your lifestyle may be. Because it's all about love, we will tolerate it. But when we have an understanding of biblical love as Christians, true love tells people the truth. And if the lifestyle you're living and the sins you're doing is going to send you to hell, if you really love them, you've got to tell them the truth. And Jesus is the truth. Amen? Amen. Right. So society kind of has a little bit of a misguided interpretation of what love's it, love is. And if we let it, it will, it will take and form our children's opinions of what love is. And let me just say this from the offset. If you remove God out of the picture, real love does not exist. I said, when you take God away, real love does not exist because the Bible says, and you just read it, God is love. God is love. Understand that. God is love. Period. And real love is kind of missing in our culture today. And it's easy because... To put it very simply for us to understand, real love is action. Mm, that's right. I could say I love my wife, but real love is when I take her to the store and I walk through the store with my mask on and walk through the store and let her shop around a little bit because I would rather be in a fight with a bull than walk <laughs> around in the mall or the store. But real love says, I'm going to do this because it's important That's to good. you. It's real love. Real love is action. See, sometimes we think if we give our kids everything that they want, that's real love. That's not. That's right. Time is important. Quality time. Real love is action. Doing things. Being there for people. It's easy to just tell somebody, I love you. I could just say, hey, I love you all. Hey, I love you. And we use the word loosely. And I'm just as guilty as anybody else. 
But real love is sacrifice and action for that person that you love. And the ultimate example is Jesus Christ. He showed us action by dying for us. Amen. That's real love. Amen. So if you take God away, you cannot experience real love. And I believe the world is starving for authentic, godly love. Amen. In the book of John, Jesus said, As I have loved you, love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Yeah. He didn't say, they'll know you're my disciples by how great your praise team is. They'll know that you're my disciples by how skillfully crafted the preacher is. And we'd lose out right there. But anyway, <laughs> he didn't say that. He said, how they will know that you are my disciples is when they see you loving each other. Not just verbalizing it, but putting action behind it. Do you know why kids today are so messed up? Because they've never experienced real love that's found in God. Come on. They're, why are kids joining gangs? Why are kids, you know, taking their own life? Why are they shooting needles in their arm? Why are they doing drugs? It's because they need to experience real love. And sometimes people are joining new age movements and cults and all these things because they experience a fake love. A fake love. Because I told you, anything that doesn't have God in it is not real love. Come on. Because the world's looking for real love. We have the answer to the world's problems. Yeah. Some people will join cults just because people show them love. Some people will do crazy things just because people are showing them that fake love, that artificial love. How much more should we be able to show people real, authentic, genuine love that is found in Christ? Come on. John, the eighth chapter. You want to get that for me, Braden? I Come can. On. You can do that. Grab that. Grab a mic there. Go get your mic over there. We can't, we can't switch mics here. We can't. There you go. He's going to go over there. I'm going to have him read a few verses for me today. Can you hear? Let's go to the New King James. Testing, 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 one, two, three. All right. All right. Okay, you, you can just go over there and sit. Did you say you John just, 8? John 8, yeah. Right, come, right. Come, come out here and take up. Is that what you want to do for? Come over here and sit down. <laughs> John 8, uh, what part? I'm gonna go We're going to start the first verse. First verse. Now he's going to go behind. Very first here. verse, I'm hiding. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple. So let me just stop here. Jesus is always on the move. We talked about this in our, our Zoom call uh, growth group the other night, how Jesus was always moving. He was always doing things. He was always going from here to there. And anytime Jesus is on the move and he shows up somewhere, things will happen. Amen? Amen. That's why we want Jesus to show up here every week. And he will if we welcome him into this place through our worship. Amen? So Jesus is on the move. And then in verse number two, go ahead and read. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. So Jesus is going to the temple and church, and he's going down, he's sitting down, he's talking to the people. Go ahead. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So understand in the scripture, the scribes and Pharisees are always trying to think they're going to trick up Jesus. They're going to stump God. How foolish is that, right? So they think they're going to stump him. So they find, they, they see this woman, and this was a festival time, so there was a lot of immorality going on. There was a lot of drunkenness. There was a lot of crazy things. And this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. So the crowd gets this woman, and they bring her to Jesus. And here she is, Guilty of what they are accusing her of. There's no question about that. So they asked Jesus, listen, the law says we should what? Stone her. Kill her. The wages of sin is what? Yeah. Death. There's a payment for sin. Death. Little did they know the payment for sin was right there in front of them. But anyway, so they're saying, guess what? She is guilty. What do you say, Jesus? And what did Jesus do? This they said, testing him. Testing that him. That they might have, yeah, go ahead. Of which to, you want to, you want to go ahead. Keep reading. Okay. That they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. And I love this because here they are asking him a question, 
And he doesn't even give them a response to the question. Listen, let me just tell you this. If you try to answer every, every one of your critics, you are going to go insane. Sometimes the best thing you can do, let me tell you like this, the best thing you can do is scroll past that post on Facebook Come on. and not get in an argument. The best thing yes. you can do sometimes yes. is to not cast your yes. pearls before yes. swine. I told you yes. this before. A lot of things are oinking out there. And if you want to give it yes. time, guess what? It's going to take away from your purpose. Yes. So Jesus didn't even respond to them. Yes. He didn't respond to them. He knelt down and he started writing in the sand. Now, People wonder, like, what was Jesus writing? We don't really know. But I heard a guy said, maybe, just maybe, he got down and he began to write. You know, John and Mary's married. Guess what, John? You haven't been real faithful to Mary, so John loves Betty. And all of a sudden, John's like, whoa, he's reading my mail here. Maybe he wrote that. Maybe he did. Maybe he started writing the names of their sin. Maybe he started writing the names of their mistresses. Maybe he started writing the names of all the things that they were doing. We really don't know, but all we know is there's Jesus playing in the dirt. Amen? Amen. You know, I don't know if I can find another time in scriptures that God played in the dirt, but I can go back, I know, at least to Genesis when God got down and began to form man from the dust of the ground. Listen, anytime Jesus plays in the dirt, something's going to happen, amen? We're all here today because Jesus played in the dirt, amen? Because God played in the dirt and created us, that's why we're here, amen? Because from the dust of the earth, He created us. So things get a little crazy when... God plays in the dirt. So here's Jesus. He's playing in the dirt. And they continued. In verse number seven, what did they say? Brave, go ahead and read that. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And it's interesting because he answered their question with a question. He didn't reply to their question. He said, you're writing in the dirt. Powerful things happen. And God messes with dirt. And all of a sudden, he says, you without sin, cast the first stone. I could only really imagine. as this woman's kneeling there, tears streaming, waiting for that first rock to come and bash her skull. Sounds brutal, but it was a brutal thing. And all of a sudden, she hears stones begin to drop all around her. Not realizing that the rock that she needed was right there for her, which was Jesus. Amen. I said the rock that she needed was right there for her, and it was Jesus. And it's interesting because as the stones begin to drop, it's such a beautiful thing when a sinner... And the Savior comes face to face. Amen. Amen. I'm here today because one day a sinner, me, and the Savior came face to face. Amen. And I'm so glad he never condoned my sin. Jesus doesn't condone sin. But he didn't condemn her either. Come on. I said, Jesus, well, he doesn't condone sin. He'll condemn the sin. But he loves the sinner. Yes. He loves the sinner. He didn't condemn her. If anybody had the right to take her life, it was him. But instead, he I'm sure, uh, you know, just think about this. As he's there, he's thinking, the penalty for your sin, the wage of your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. The gift that you need is right here in front of you, and it's Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Amen? That's who he is. And it's interesting because if we would take our own sin list, we're all in that same boat. Come on, if somebody says they have no sin, they're lying to you because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of his glory. And these scribes and Pharisees were very good at pointing their fingers at everybody else. I told you before, Grandma always told me to watch when you point your finger. How many's pointing back at you, right? It's three. 
three point right back at you. And they thought they were going to trap Jesus. Fully, foolish, fully scribes and Pharisees. You ain't trapping Jesus. They were trying to trap him. And they didn't realize who they were dealing with. See, we need to remember who Jesus is. Can I just give you a couple things of who Jesus is? Does somebody know that he's the almighty one? Yes. Uh, that, that ought to give you a hand clap or something. I mean, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Jesus. Does somebody know that Jesus is the alpha and omega? Does somebody know he's our advocate? He's the perfecter of our faith. He has all of authority. He is the bread of life. He's the son of God. He is the bridegroom. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the deliverer. Is somebody hear me in this house? He is faithful and true. He is our good shepherd. He is our great high priest. He is the head of the church. He is our holy servant. He is I am. He is Emmanuel. He's an indescribable gift. He's judge. He's king of kings. He's lamb of God. He's the light of the world. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Can you relate to who I'm talking about? He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's Lord of all. He's my mediator. He's the Messiah. He's the mighty one. He's the one who set you free. He's our hope. He's our peace. He's our prophet. He's our redeemer. He is our risen, living Savior. He is the rock. He is the sacrifice for our sin. He is our Savior. He is supreme creator of all. He's resurrected. He is alive. He is the door. He is the way. He is the word. He is the true vine. He is the truth. He is victorious. He is the Prince of Peace. He is all of these things. That's who we serve. It's Jesus. It's all in Him. That's who we serve. How foolish are these scribes and Pharisees to think they're going to trick Jesus? How foolish. Foolish rabbits. Tricks are for kids, right? It says it like this in 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Come on. Does not boast. It's not proud. That's love. It's real love. Patient, kind. Does not boast. Does not envy. Let me just give you a couple points about real love and then I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to make this real quick. Real love is this. Real love meets the needs of others before it meets the needs of yourself. Real love will meet the need of others before it meets the need of self. There's some mamas here and some daddies here that understand that because I, even in my own life, have seen my parents go without so we could have. Come on. And we've done the same thing for our children. That's real love. So you know what? I'll go without as long as you have. That's real love. Real love puts the needs of others before ourselves. I want to give you an illustration of real love. I talked to a gentleman just last week. He told me a story. He said one of his co-workers was not feeling well. And he said we should have sent him to the hospital right from the factory. But he said he decided he was going to drive himself to the hospital. And he said on the way to the hospital, he was at a stoplight and he went unresponsive. Just so happens... By the miraculous hand of God, there was an ambulance right behind him. He went unresponsive, and of course the ambulance first was blowing the horn, and they went up and checked on him, and they was able to revive him and take him straight to the hospital. Praise God. He said, at that moment, he said, I heard what was happening, he said, and God spoke to me and says, go to the hospital and pray for your friend. He said, the very next day before I went to the hospital, he said, I was, went and got the news of my own situation. He said, I, I went to the doctor and I had a bone scan done a little bit ago. And he said, I went there as I'm sitting in a doctor's office, believe in God for a great report. The news came that I have bone cancer. He said, it's all I could do to keep it together and He said, my wife and I got in our car and our next stop was the hospital to pray for my friend. And my wife said, you sure you want to go right now? And he said, even though in my 
heart and my mind, I was struggling, trying to process the news that I just received. He said, that Holy Ghost in me just reared up. Amen. He said, and I said, Satan, you're not stopping me from praying for my friend. Right. That's real love. So he went to the hospital, not even knowing if they would allow him in. And through the mercy of God, he was able to get in and pray for his friend. He said, you know what? He said, Pastor, he said, as I went in there, he said, I, I wasn't even thinking about what I was facing. I was thinking about this knee. But he said, I will tell you this. When I went in there and I saw him, he said, my faith just dropped. He said, there was tubes everywhere. He's on a ventilator. He said, and even then, he said, my faith just plummeted. But there's the God of hope right there. Come on. And he said, I said, you know what? God, you told me to come here, and I'm doing what you told me to do. He said, it's all I could do to lay hands on him and pray for him. But he said, I just wanted to be obedient, and I wasn't going to let Satan stop me. He said, so I prayed for him the best I could. And he said, I went out and I sat and talked to the family a little bit. They didn't even know what I was dealing with. And he said, I ended up going home. He said, the next morning I get up and he says, I felt so impressed to the Lord. And God spoke to me before three o'clock. You're going to hear something. And he said, I watched. And the clock just kept ticking and ticking. I'm like, was this God or was this me? He said, right around the three o'clock hour, the phone rang. He said, it was one of my other friends on the phone line. He says, I have something to tell you about our friend. He said, and immediately I'm thinking the worst. My prayer didn't work. And he said, what do you have to say? He said, he's off the ventilator. He's sitting up in his room. He's talking. He recognizes everybody and he's doing well. And he said, I was so thankful. And I saw God heal my friend. Right. But he's still battling his cancer himself. That's real love. Yes, yes. Putting the needs of others above ourselves. Come on. And as we sat there and we prayed for his healing, he says, I know God can heal me because he's already brought me through so many things. Right. So I could just tell you story after story. I shouldn't even be alive right now. But he's always been faithful. But he said something that just impacted me. He said, I know I'm going to be healed one way or the other. And if I'm not healed physically here, I know I'll be physically healed in heaven. That's a story of, of real love, a living, breathing story. And I sat there with tears in my eyes and said, can I share your story? He said, absolutely. He said, I won't say your name. But I said, I will share your story. Because that's real love. Real love is action. Nothing about real love is real love will lead people to Christ. That's right. Because you can't have real love without God. Love is effectuous. It will, it will be, attract people. You know, I heard a story of the preacher who got on a bus and stumbling onto the bus was this drunk and he was had way too much to drink. He smelled like a brewery, brewery factory. What do you call that? A brewing factory? Brewery, not a brewery. brewery. Brewing factory? Thank you. Yeah. Well, he was drunk and he smelled like beer. Let's just say it. All right. And this young preacher was full of faith and he had his Bible. And it's interesting because sometimes, you know, you got to use wisdom in winning the lost. And he thought, you know, I'm going to help this man right now. So he goes over and he sits beside the man and he says, listen. And the man's out of it. He said, do you know, sir, you are going to hell? The guy looked back at him. He said, sir, do you know you're going to hell? The drunk said, oh, no. I get on the wrong bus again. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we got to use wisdom in winning the lost, right? Yeah. We have to tell people the truth. There is a heaven, there is a hell. Yeah. But if you think by carrying around your King James Version family Bible and beating people over the head with it, it's going to show real love. It's not. That's right. Come on. Real love is action. That's, That's right. right. Real love is being there for them. Right. 
showing them. And I'll tell you this, and I can guarantee you this, when you live for Christ, you don't have to put the Jesus bumper sticker on or wear the Jesus t-shirt because let me tell you, in your workplace, people are going to see a difference in you. Right. You don't laugh at the jokes. You don't say off-color things. You don't do that. You know, why is that? It's Christ. Jesus said we are the light of the what? World. We are the light of the world. One more thing about real love. Real love sees people for what they can become rather than what they are. Yeah. Come on now. Somebody needs to hear that. This woman that was caught in the very act of adultery, what a pitiful sight. But Jesus didn't see her as what she was. He saw her as what she could become. And I'm so thankful that one day he looked down on me and he says, I'm not seeing Jeff Martin as what he is, but I'm seeing him as what I can mold him and make him to be. Yeah. Amen. That's love. And as this woman was kneeling with tears streaming down her face, Jesus looked at her and says, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? Have no man condemn thee? And watch the last verse, verse 11. Put it up there. She said, no man, Lord. And right there, Jesus could have said, well, guess what? I condemn you because I'm God. But he didn't. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Watch this. Go and sin no more. He didn't tell her to keep living her lifestyle. He said, go and sin no more. That's real love. Amen. Forgiveness. The power yeah. of forgiveness right there. Love's a verb. Amen. As our musicians come and, and get ready, I love this portion of scripture in 1 Corinthians as you could just stand your feet. In Corinthians, the sixth chapter, Paul paints a picture of what really is in the church. He talks about how wicked people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. He gives a long list and says, you know, those who are sexual and more adulterers, you know, those who are fornicators, all these lists, drunkards, slanders, these swindlers, all this list of things. Paul says, none of these people will make it into heaven. And I love this scripture because Paul said, listen, church, such were some of you. The only difference between them and you is you had a moment with Jesus. And he forgave you of your sins. I said the only difference between them and me is I had this moment with Jesus. And he forgave me of my sins. And I've been washed and justified and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. How much does he love you? Yes, he loves us. He loves you so much that he thought you were worth dying for. That he stretched out his arms and he died for you. As you lift your hands all over this house, as they sing this song, How He Loves Us, I want you just to thank him for his love. Thank him for his love. Thank him for his love. And if you would like to come and spend some moments alone at the altar today, this altar's open. If you need help in giving your life to Jesus or being filled with the Spirit, come and see me. I will help you with that. But there needs to be a gratitude in this place to say, Lord, while I was a sinner, you died for me. And you love me. Lord, we just, in this house, we pray that real love will just flow out of this place. Not fake, not manufactured, but an authentic love of God, an authentic love of God, which is found only in Jesus Christ, only in you. Come on, let it marinate you right now in his love. If you want to come and spend some moments with him, please do. Let it work on you. If you want to receive right of your seat, that's fine. We thank you for your love. Like a bird.